Hello, Margaret. So happy to have you on the podcast today. You are a wealth of knowledge. I've heard you speak before about the topics that we're going to be talking about over the next hour or so. I thought I have got to get her on, even though I have done a deep dive into digestion and autoimmune because we've lived it in our household, but you explain it so well. So thanks so much for coming on the show today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Yes, absolutely. Excited for you to be here. So just very quickly, before we get into even your backstory, I notice you are your credentials, FNTP. I always feel like I botched this because it's like, I'm traditionally trained registered dietitian, but I always right. tell people, no, I would go back. Like if I could do it over again, I do the functional, is it functional nutrition therapy practitioner? Is that yeah, what functional, functional nutritional therapy practitioner. They added the functional, it used to be just nu nutritional therapy practitioner. And then they kind of split up the designation. Some of us have training in this hands-on functional assessment technique. That's where the functional comes in. So yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful, but, um, but yeah, that was my, my primary training lots and stuff after that, but that was the starting point for sure. The starting point. Yes. And that's yeah. where I always get tripped up. I'm like, wait, is this a separate credential? Kind of like how they added the N onto RD and right. that trips everybody up. And I get questions like, are you a re registered dietitian nurse? I'm like, nope. <laughs> they just added that nutritionist on there. Um, so that's great. And like I said, I, I could go back and do it all over again. I would definitely go that route. It's so practical and just gives you more of the hands-on that people need and um, has definitely gotten you to where you are now. So yeah, give us your backstory and how you got to be where you are today. And I know you specialize a lot in the autoimmune digestive realm, but how did you get interested in that and get to where you are now? Well, this started a really long time ago when I was, when I was a kid. Um, I had a front row seat to my mom's very severe autoimmune processes. She had two different diagnoses. She had both lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, um, as well as other things. Like that wasn't the only health complications, but these were like the heavy hitters. And um, she went the hardcore Western medical route. And this was actually back in the day when there was so little research into autoimmunity. I remember she started bringing home books about AIDS. And it was like, huh? And she was like, well, they think that if they can figure out what triggers AIDS, because AIDS shuts down the immune system, then, then they will figure out autoimmunity because autoimmunity is an overactive immune system. And it was like, okay. I mean, I, now I think about it, it just sounds ludicrous, but that's how, that's where they were at, right? That's where this, the thinking was at. So, um, so she was put on hardcore immunosuppressive drugs, anti-inflammatories, and it was just this really painful, slow process of degradation, right? Like for every improvement she would make, whether that would be some kind of surgical procedure or some new medicine. I mean, first of all, just managing drugs was like such an insane project because all the different contraindications and the side effects and like, you know, I mean, half the thing she was on was just managing the side effects from the core drugs she needed to take. Um, and she was in many ways a medical miracle, you know, like she, given, given how little they knew and how severe her conditions were, it was constantly, it was like, wow, like, look at what we've been able to do. And yet the reality is the quality of her life was awful. You know, I mean, she was in miserable most of the time. Um, I mean, she was a trooper. I mean, talk about a fighter. Like she just did not give up. Um, but it was just, you know, one step forward, five steps back, two steps forward, six steps back, you know, and I can remember this one really poignant time when she got a hangnail. She was a concert pianist, so she took impeccable care of her hands. And so even the fact that she got a hangnail was kind of weird, but she got a hangnail and that got infected and it turned into a three month hospital stay because that infection traveled all the way up her arm and she didn't have an immune system to deal with it. And then they put her on all these high dose antibiotics and it was antibiotic resistant. I mean, it just turned into this massive ordeal for a hangnail. And to me, that just epitomizes um, what was wrong with this. And I just, even then, I didn't know anything about natural health. I didn't really, I mean, I love to eat food, but that was as much as my relationship with food. Um, I, I knew there had to be a different way. And um, it wasn't until much later, you know, I had a personal experience with my own health and food when I was in my 20s. I'd had really bad eczema, which at the time we didn't know actually has autoimmune origins. Now, of course, we know that that's actually an autoimmune condition, but at the time we didn't realize that. And um, 
it was horrible from the time I was in my mid teens until my mid twenties. And, um, my, a friend of mine was much more into doing things kind of naturally. And she was like, you know, maybe you should look at this a different way. Have you thought about changing your diet? And I kind of thought like, what would that have anything to do with my skin? But I was at the point where it just seemed unreasonable to keep getting higher, you know, dosages of this cortisone cream that I was using that was kind of managing it, but really not. And um, I went to this practitioner and she did all sorts of tests on me and we dramatically changed my diet and all these supplements. I didn't really didn't understand what was happening, but what I'll tell you is three weeks later, that eczema was gone and it's never come back. Um, you know, and that's what like 23 years later. So, I mean, it was, that was a profound moment of like, oh, wow what we eat is really important in terms of our health. And it took me a while before I decided to do this professionally, but it has really, um, it was those combination of experiences watching my mom who ultimately lost her life to side effects from the medications that were keeping her alive. Um, so watching her go through that really painful process. And then this moment where I experienced the incredible power of the healing power of food, um, those things just came together. And I realized this is what I want to do. And it's just become my absolute mission to help people bring autoimmune into remission naturally, which is, which I'm able to do every single day. And I, you know, we, if I knew, I, you know, if I knew then what I knew now, although, you know, I did know a lot of what I know now then, and, you know, my mom was not really into it. So, <laughs> but it was a really powerful inspiration. And I just sort of have this mantra of like, not on my watch, like that's not, yeah, I got my own autoimmune diagnosis when I was pregnant with my second daughter. And I was like, there is no way I'm letting my girls watch me slowly die of autoimmune disease the way I watch my mom die. Like that's just not happening. And I'm not anybody who kind of comes into my circle, any, any, you know, anyone who is in that place, like I've just, there's so much we can do to calm and sort of re-educate that immune system so that it does what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Autoimmune diseases are so tough and tricky because on the one hand you have to have, you have to have the buy-in from whoever has the autoimmune disease or condition to even let them mentally embrace that there is a reason why your auto, your immune system's being triggered. We need to figure out what that is instead of masking it with the medications that most of the medical, um, community will, will try to mask all of the symptoms and, you know, bring your immune system down instead of saying, Hey, like what, what, what's triggering this and why? And yeah, it is really tough just to watch loved ones go through it. My son was diagnosed at age 11 with ulcerative colitis. And, um, you know, we were told that it's been an autoimmune disease as well. And, just to watch the pure suffering and trying to, you know, just trying, I'm sure your mom went through this like protocol after protocol and diets and therapies and researching, like it is, it is all consuming. So it's so refreshing to see people like you say, you know what, there's, there's a reason why your body is reacting. It is not natural for you to be in pain every day and for you to have digestive issues every it's common, but it's not natural. So let's get to the base root cause of what is, what is going on. And, and I think the, um, you know, another very big struggle that people have is what works for one person or what is the trigger for one person? Is not necessarily the trigger for the next person? Um, and it's just autoimmunity. You mentioned there wasn't a lot of research. There weren't a lot of protocols to follow or medications or, um, you know, natural healers around autoimmunity when your mom was going through it because it hasn't it hadn't exploded like it has now. So now it's like we've had, you know, kids, middle age, like it's just running rampant. And um, it, it seems like in the medical profession, it's like, if we can't put a label on it, we're just kind of saying, oh, that's an autoimmune disease. And, you know, the, the number of autoimmune diseases are just yeah. continuing to rise and grow. And, um, yeah, so very thankful that there's people like you who can educate us and, and try to turn that around. So you don't have to live your life. And I think that's the, a really tragic part of autoimmunity and autoimmune diseases, like you're diagnosed and it's just like a death sentence. Like, Oh my gosh, I have to live with this until I die. Like, I don't think I can do that. So, um, there's, uh, uh, 
obviously the mental depression part that goes along with it too. So why do you think we're seeing such a rise in autoimmune diseases? I, I know a lot of it of what you teach, it comes back to the food that we're ingesting, like you mentioned, but why do you think we're seeing such an explosion? I think that the environment that we live in, and I mean that in all things, like both what we're putting into our body, the air we're breathing, the water that we're drinking, the lives that we're living, the stress inputs, the, the you know, sitting at our desks all day long, staring at screens. I mean, we are just, our systems are so out of sync with what we are biologically designed to do and how we are biologically designed to live, right? Like we are not you know, the, what are all, all the memes, right? Like sitting is the new smoking and that like, just there's where our systems are inundated with so many different types of stressors. Um, some of those physiological stressors, whether that's toxins, the pesticides and the foods that we eat, that's just what, what we're, you know, just living in the city, you know, the air that we breathe. I can remember when I, I lived in LA for a while. I can remember when I first moved to LA, I got the worst case of pneumonia I'd ever had. And talking with people, they're like, oh, yeah, that's like what happens when you first move to L.A. And it's like, is that not a problem? <laughs> like, that's like, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, and, and then and then I my body became accustomed to it, which in and of itself was a little unsettling. It's yes. like I'm, I'm used to being in such a toxic soup that my body has figured out ways of compensating, which is what we do as humans. But it's, um, you know, it's even, you know, the stresses in our lives, just, you know, the mental stresses the you know, all of these things, these challenges to our physiology will, will compromise our immune system. And I think what people need to realize is our immune system is so powerful, right? You know, it's, it's powerful. It's really complex. Um, I like to break things down to, into really simple form. So, you know, really at its simplest our immune system has two jobs to protect us from foreign invaders, things like parasites and pathogenic bacteria, viruses, et cetera. Um, and then the other job is internal housekeeping. I think that's the job that people don't realize that the, the, the immune system has. Like, you know, we think of it really as this sort of protection, which it is, but it's also in charge of like cleanup. And there's a lot more cleanup that needs to happen as a result of living in this environment that we live in. And, um, and uh, you know, the immune system, when it, you know, it has this powerful mechanism to be able to distinguish self from other. And then when it comes to other, to be able to distinguish between friend and foe. And so when you have an autoimmune situation, what's happening is that mechanism of differentiation has gone awry. And now the immune system is attacking the friendly self that it is supposed to be protecting. It's sort of treating that as though it was the enemy other, right? And um, and so the that is, as you said, that's the question that doesn't get asked enough is like, well, then why is this happening? That's not just like, oh, you have a bad immune system. Let's shut it down because that's where you get into situations like a hangnail becomes a life-threatening yeah. three-month hospital stay, which is absurd, Right. Um, I mean, those I'm not, and, and those drugs can be really helpful and invaluable in the short term as you're doing this deeper work, but that deeper work is so important. So I think reason why we're seeing so much more of it is just this onslaught. I mean, the, you know, the list of issues, it can be a bit depressing because they're so all encompassing and it can just feel utterly overwhelming because we can't just like lock ourselves in some little bubble. We're not all going to like run off into the woods, you know, and start growing our own food. And if we did, it would cause its own problem, right? Like we got too many humans on planet earth. Like there's a lot of things that this can kind of come back to. Right. So, um, you know, but, but, um, there are some really important pieces that we can address, um, because the body is really resilient. You know, I'm always telling my six-year-old is always falling and skinning her knee. Like, every other day. Right. And so it comes in in tears and I'm always telling her you're, you are a healing machine. Like this is what you are designed to do. You are a healing machine. We all are, we're healing machines. And if something has gone awry with that, we just need to do some deeper digging, uh, and relieve the immune system of, um, at some of the biggest burdens that it's dealing with. There's no way we can get rid of all of them. It's just not possible, but, um, it, and to live in the, mo this modern world, I don't actually know where you could go to live where you could <laughs> right. stuff, like at this point. So we, it's, it's part of living on planet earth, but, um, there's things that we can do to mitigate that there's, there's big, bigger lever points that we can move that can have a huge difference. And just like any of us, right. When we are always engaged in never 
never given a break. Um, I like to say, you know, we start to make bad decisions, or at least I will take responsibility. When I am overtired, overworked, and underrested, I start to make bad decisions. And it's the exact same thing with the immune system, right? When it's just constantly dealing with stuff, it starts to make bad decisions. And so that's the question is like, what are the biggest things that it's dealing with every single day? And how can we remove those and then allow the immune system to sort of recalibrate and to remember what is um, friend and what is foe? Yeah, that's some really powerful way of thinking. And I think when you're stuck in that illness day after day, <laughs> it's just so overwhelming and you feel like you're you're never going to get well. And so much of it is just like you said, like peeling back the layers and one thing at a time, letting that immune system go back to a state of not hyper vigilant. And I remember when my son was really ill, I would think, okay, it's, you know, like you, you have, you, you hear people say, oh, it's a faulty immune system. It's like, well, is it faulty or is it yeah. just hypervigilant? And it's just doing its job. <laughs> like it's just doing its job wasn't doing its job. There would be some really horrible issues going on. So I know, um, food plays a huge role <laughs> with autoimmunity right. and, um, a, you know, a lot of forward thinkers say that it all starts in the gut and, um, we talk a lot about nutrition on this podcast and a lot of, we, we focus a lot on weight loss and weight loss resistance, but that all comes food circle, full circle and comes food circle, <laughs> that all comes full circle. And a lot of even weight loss resistance can go back to fault, you know, faults in the digestive process. So Let's start there. And, um, you know, why, why should healing our digestion and maybe even like what to look for? Because I feel like in this day and age, things that you think are normal for your digestion, like maybe you've just always had diarrhea, like since totally. the time you were a little kid, or you've been a bit constipated or, you know, I thought I, I started to really struggle with bloating in my college years up until about five years ago when I really revamped the foods I was eating and the fuel I was putting in my body. I just thought, well, that's just how I am. I honestly did. I'm like, I just oh, yeah. get bloated really easily. And so many people think that, um, but yeah, what, what do we even look for as, um, you know, just reframing our thinking around digestion? Like it is not normal to be constipated and bloated and having diarrhea. Um, and where do we even start with there? It's such a vast topic and I know it's, it's a, a big hard one. question, yeah. um, but what are the, what are some things that we can start looking at? Um, and, and, and maybe you can speak a little bit about testing on that too, or we can move on to that after we look at where to start. Sure thing. Well, so I think, I think first and foremost, to understand the relationship and why digestion and thus everything that we eat has such a huge impact is because the vast majority of our immune system lives in and around the digestive process, right? Like our diet. So, you know, just to think about, I actually, lo I love digestion so much. I think it's just this kind of miraculous moment where the outside world becomes us. Like, <laughs> I don't want to get all like spiritual woo woo about it, but it is just kind of magnificent. I mean, really, we are basically walking food right? I mean, every single cell in your body, you know, I always say to clients, like, look at your hands, like the nail, the skin, the joints, the muscles, like all of that was once food that your body has broken down and then harvested the various nutrients that it needs. It's fueling when we, we kind of think of it, like just fuel is our food is that it just gives us energy, but it's so much more than that. Like they, there's always that example. And I've been guilty of using it as well of like, you know, you, you spend more money on the gas that you put in your car than the, than what you eat, but it, that then makes it that sort of limits the impact of food to this is what fuels you. Well, it's a lot more than fuel. Like this is, like, so this is structurally like the gas that goes to your car literally does fuel the car. It doesn't build the car. That's not the way it works with the human body. Like it builds you. So, um, so it's a really, really profound and important process. And, you know, we think of, um, we think of it as the digestive process as the mother of the body, right? Like it's nurturing us from the inside. And it's also, you know, the, the digestive tube. So it's the digestive tract is basically, you know, one big long tube from your mouth 
down to your anus. Um, I like to say, you know, and it's still the outside of the body. That's another thing that we don't think of, but that is like sort of the final frontier, right? Like where things become us. And so um, I like to say we're basically a really complicated donut and the donut hole <laughs> is our digestive tube. And, um, and you know, there, the, there are these moments um, where our, you know, like the small intestine, I think is this really incredible part of the digestive process where, you know, at this stage, you know, by the time food gets there, right. It has been mechanically broken down both because of our chewing, because of like what happens in our stomach and sort of the pulsating and then all of the chemical breakdowns with different types of enzymes and things. So basically you ideally in a properly functioning digestive system, you have just at this point, basically you just have like the key nutrients um, that then get absorbed directly into the bloodstream from that small intestine. And the lining of that small intestine is so thin, right? It's one cell thick and it's made up of these tight junctions. So these cells line up side by side, kind of like little soldiers, right? And they open up through the gates, like individually as very, very hyper selectively, just letting in what should get into your blood to become you and to, to fuel different processes, et cetera. Um, but what happens is when the digestive process is compromised in that you can have an, a, a, you know, one cell thick, not hard to damage that lining. Right. Um, and then all sorts of things can get into the bloodstream that shouldn't be there. Toxins, undigested food. I mean, it could be like the most beautifully locally grown, properly prepared piece of broccoli, right. From your lunch. But if that gets into the bloodstream, prematurely, right. When it's not in its sort of nutrient form, your immune system doesn't recognize it as of nutrients. It recognizes it as an enemy and it's having to do that cleanup work that we talked about earlier, or it's flagging it as like a, as a pathogen saying like, this is a bad guy. And next time I see it, I'm going to be like right on it. Right. Um, and so, so there's the immune system is very, very involved in that part of our system simply because there is so much, that is this final frontier, you know, it's an important, we call it a barrier, right? It's an important barrier into the rest of the body. And so, you know, basically the immune system is, is very vigilant right there, trying to make sure that things don't get in to the, the blood that shouldn't be there. And if they do, they're like right on it. So if you think about that, and then you think about the fact that most of us are eating daily and normally multiple times a day, um, there's a lot of opportunity for things to go awry and for the immune system to get engaged. So that's why it's so important and so critical to like to autoimmunity in particular, but really to anything, you know, like if anyone comes into, to see me as a, as a client, um, you know, even without digestive symptoms, I'm always looking at the gut first, because if there's any dysfunction there, then that's going to have a massive ripple effect on how far we can get with their healing. And I think that piece that, you know, you asked about what does this look like? So Oh gosh, the symptoms are sort of endless. And I completely agree with you that we get so used to it. I mean, before I studied nutrition, I thought it was totally normal to have to lie down in the fetal position for like 30 minutes after eating because I had such <laughs> bad gut pain. Oh. I just got so used to it. Huh. It was normal for me. So I didn't even know that there was another way. It was just like, oh yeah, after you eat, you lie down. Doesn't everybody do that? Turns out no. Um, and you know, there was a lot of things. There's a lot of dysfunctions. I also, you know, I was so my blood sugar handling was so out of control. I could not fathom a day without my mid-afternoon coffee and chocolate. Like, mm -hmm. could a human get through the, you know, three to four o'clock window without a like high sugar snack and caffeine? Like, I didn't think that was humanly possible. Turns out it is. <laughs> um, so I think that we our baseline is so low. You know, I often, you know, feel like in many ways, um, our work as a nutrition professionals is to help clients see the potential. And I'm always trying thinking to myself, like, I can't wait till you feel so much, like you don't even know how good you can feel yeah. right now. Right. Like yeah. there's so much, but any kind of, you know, like it's normal to have a good bowel movement every day. Even sometimes if you're having multiples a day, you know, but like your bowels are really important in terms of just sort of monitoring your digestive health. That's one of the best ways to do it. Having just a good, you know, sort of the gold standard poop, right? Like you're not having to use any kind of force. You don't have to do any fancy routines. Like you don't yeah. need to have a coffee and a smoke in order to make it happen. You can right. just like 
go because you ate and you need to go, right? It's not, you're not needing to like wipe 30 times and go through a roll of toilet paper. Um, it's not like it, poo smells like poo. So it's, there's a little bit of a smell, but it's not like you're gassing out the family, you know, with it in terms of smell, you're not seeing undigested food in there. Um, you know, sort of soft serve ice cream is a great consistency to go for. Um, and, um, yeah, and happening daily. That's, that's actually gold standard and very few people do that. You know, I mean, I've had many clients come in and think, and I was like this too. I thought it was completely normal to only have a bowel movement, like every three days. It's like, oh, you do that more than more frequently. (laughs) Right. Yeah. There's some toxicity building up there. (laughs) A little bit, a little bit. And just, and you know, eating should be a really pleasurable experience. Like it should not have any kind of discomfort, whether that is belching afterwards. I mean, something just things that we think of as like just funny, but like if you eat and you're belching a whole bunch for the next 30 minutes, like there's something up, right? I mean, it might not be uncomfortable, but that is telling us that you're, I mean, probably a little hypochlorhydric, you know, like if you're not chewing your food enough, maybe there's some H. pylori going on. Like there's some, you know, that kind of upper GI stuff or, but nothing should hurt. Nothing should be bloated. You shouldn't, it, it should just be, you eat the food and you feel good and you feel satiated for a number of hours. You shouldn't need to eat every two hours. Um, you should be able to go four or five hours. And then when you feel hungry, it should be like, oh, I feel hungry, but it shouldn't be a state of emergency. Like you're going to, you know, maybe knock someone's head off if they come near you because you haven't eaten. Right. Like, so, and these are, these are things that, you know, it, it, we can laugh about it, but it's, it's, you know, I know I lived in a way that if I didn't eat every sort of hour and a half to two hours, I would have like either kind of like not passed out, but sort of just like to the world out completely as I was so spaced out because I was so hypoglycemic or like ragey, ragey, ragey. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I mean, I thought it was normal to have major gut pain and lie down after every meal and only have a bowel movement every three days. So, you know, I think any kind of discomfort at all is a sign that there's something up. And if you have autoimmune presentation, and you're that rare bird. Most people with autoimmune presentation do have some kind of digestive discomfort, but not always. You know, I remember I had a client with very severe POTS and she came in and she joked that she could eat pebbles. Like she had such a great digestion. And I was like, okay, well, we'll, we'll see about that. And we did some testing and oh my gosh, all the things that we found in there. And we addressed her digestion and that is what reversed her POTS. So it's even without symptoms, it's something you want to be looking at. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, so what are the heavy hitters? Would you say if somebody's looking to start, I mean, do we, should we always start with testing or should we start with like just removing some of these heavy hitters that most people are sensitive to and, you know, gluten and dairy probably being the biggest culprits. I know I've been gluten-free for at least six years, unless I accidentally get exposed to it. And I just feel so much better being gluten-free and I, I'm not totally dairy-free, but I am pretty much grain-free as well. But what are the big heavy hitters that we can remove or should, is testing, um, you know, a better first step than just going, going full throttle and starting to remove some of these things. And I know with food sensitivity testing, that can be tricky too, because sometimes things that you're eating, like you said, with those tight junctions are, um, compromised and there's foods that you eat a lot of, or very frequently are getting into the blood bloodstream, they might show up on that sensitivity testing. Um, so it, it, it just gets tricky and people get yeah. so confused. Like, should I get some food like sensitivity testing done? Should I just start ma- trying to manage it on my own? Like, what are your thoughts on that? I think that for true and full healing, testing is invaluable, but that doesn't mean that you can't get started now. Um, I would, you know, a hundred percent gluten is out done autoimmune saying that <laughs> yeah they just don't mix i'm i'm not like i, I don't i a, completely agree right i don't have too many like hard nose but like gluten is a hard no when it comes to um when it comes to autoimmunity i don't i can't really recommend it for anybody but like if there's I, any I kind of autoimmune we're right. done mm-hmm. um and so if you're still eating gluten, like just start there. Right. And that's a big, it's a big project to get gluten out of the diet when it's, when you're first doing it. So I think that that's a really good first step if that hasn't already happened. Um, dairy, if with, in the absence of testing, other things that I would pull out would be dairy, soy, 
Uh, dairy and soy in the absence of testing. Now, two other things that I think should go from everybody's diet would be refined sugars and um, um, industrially processed seed oils. Mm-hmm. And again, those are not small projects. Like we can say no. these instead of just flippantly, but even right. just the seed oils, like, I mean, a gr- you know, some great brands of, of grain-free products still use like sunflower uh-huh. oil or safflower. It drives me crazy. Yeah. So um, if you are truly to get rid of all vegetable sort of see those really processed seed oil. So we're talking about corn oil, soy oil, cotton seed oil, which is like cotton seed. Like, is that? Yeah. Food? Like who would ever eat a cotton seed? Like, like bring you out have- your sh- I don't know. It just, I mean, yeah. you know, these, these like industrial byproducts that they're trying to find uses for, right. Yeah. And sunflower oil, safflower oil, like all of these, if it comes in like clear plastic bottle, it's out. It's just out. Um, and so, um, you know, you want to be using really good fats and oils like, you know, ghee from pasture raised cows or coconut oil or, you know, avocado oil, or even like a macadamia nut oil. Like these are a lot, they're less processed, although the more popular, like all of these, like even something like avocado oil, if we talked about avocado oil, like two, three years ago, it was still so sort of new on the market that, um, it hadn't like hit the mainstream. And so it was still relatively clean. And now I feel like you have to be so like sleuthy with your brands and things, because now they're cutting it with all sorts of stuff. So, you know, our olive oil, although, you know, for cooking, I'm always, I always recommend that we use more of the saturated fats or even things like, you know, beef tallow and lard, like those are these traditional animal fats are fantastic sources. Um, but not this like industrially processed seed oils, which are just, oh, they're just so inflammatory. And that's the thing to think about anything that causes inflammation, that is a process managed by the immune system. So that is going to absolutely, you know, exhaust, um, the immune system. So, you know, getting industrially, industrially processed seed oils, like refined sugars, um, and, um, gluten, dairy and soy out of the diet is a really, really solid starting point. And, you know, I mean, worst case scenario, what's going to happen? You're going to feel better. You might not fully reverse things, but you're definitely going to feel better. Um, And you're probably going to lose some weight if you have some weight to lose. Um, And just everything is cleaned up. And then from there, I find testing really helpful. I mean, there definitely are diets that are more sort of generic elimination diets, like the autoimmune paleo diet or, um, you know, the Walls protocol. And these are fantastic protocols. The challenge with them is that they are so, you know, I mean, we just come back to bioindividuality and with autoimmunity, I feel like this is just where bioindividuality just always like anytime we try to do something that's generic, bioindividuality is going to come kind of hit us over the head and remind us that it just doesn't work that way because a trigger for one person is just not almost never the same trigger for the next right. person or the set of triggers. We like to think it's just one thing. It's always a combination. So this is where testing is invaluable. Cause I can't tell you the number of clients I've had who come to me on these really restrictive diets and they still feel miserable and their life is so hard because they're really, I mean, so you think what I just listed is hard, you know, like AIP diet, what we're taking out all nuts, all seeds, all nightshades, all dairy, all, um, eggs, and nights, you know, seeds and nightshades, that affects so much more than just the bulk foods. Like that affects your spice drawer, right? Like you can't right. have anything that's from a pepper or like mustard seed. Like you have to end up, you're just doing using herbs and, and alliums like onions and things and garlic. I mean, it, it is just dramatically restrictive. So, um, so you know, I, if you're going to go to that end, you want to be feeling better. And for some people it does, but it, I feel like that's actually the exception. Normally doing the testing just allows us to see, well, what in your body is triggering inflammation? Not what sort of usually triggers it in most people, like what's happening in your body. And so, um, now that said, so testing is something that I'm very passionate about. I'm a big believer in it just because it cuts to the chase, right? So if you are just starting on this journey, if you have the resources and you're keen to jump in, then like, by all means, jump in with testing and like work with a practitioner who knows how to use these tools because it will save so much time and so much effort, right? Um, because, and I, I always use two tests in combination as a starting point. Um, I always do a stool test to understand what's going on in the digestive tract. And I do this whether the person has symptoms or no symptoms. I mean, certainly if they're not symptomatic, but there's autoimmunity, then you would have absolutely no idea where to start without some kind of testing to see what's happening. But for the individual with symptoms, I mean, let's just take one simple symptom of constipation. I mean, 
there's so many things that could be driving that, right? Is it a digestive function issue? Like, are they not digest, you know, are they not secreting enough digestive enzymes or are they hypochlorhydric, meaning low stomach acid? Are they, you know, do they have sluggish bile flow? So they're not breaking down their fats properly and not stimulating peristalsis. And that's just like functional issues. It could be, are they eating foods that are they're sensitive to? And that's triggering constipation. Do they have leaky gut? Do they have some kind of imbalance in their, in their microbiome? Maybe they have a fungal overgrowth. I mean, there's just like endless things it could be. Um, and so when you do testing, it just gets you a lot narrower, right? Like it just allows you as the practitioner to be much more specific about your approach because, you know, somebody with fungal overgrowth, it's going to be a different approach than somebody who is like, you know, simply hypochlorhydric, right? And, and, and often it's not that simple. Often it's like some very specific combination of a bunch of different things. Um, and so you, we use the gut testing to inform and guide the digestive healing work. And then alongside this, we use a food sensitivity testing and we use a very specific food sensitivity test. We use the MRT from Oxford Biomedical. And I know some practitioners love it, some hate it. We use it in a very specific way. Um, and we use it always alongside the stool testing. Um, we never do food sensitivity testing alone and we never do gut testing alone. And there's very specific reasons for that. But what what we use the MRT to do, it's an endpoint test. So it's, I don't know how much in the weeds you want to get into the different types of food sensitivity testing. I'm totally happy to go there. But all like the, the quick and dirty version is the MRT tells us what foods are triggering an inflammatory process in the body. That's what we care about, right? Is like what foods are triggering that inflammatory process. And so we pull out the foods that are triggering the inflammatory process. And this is not a forever thing. This is a short-term thing while we heal the gut based on what we learned from that stool test. Um, and then we can often reintroduce a lot of those foods. Like the goal of this is not to make your life hard and to have re really restrictive. Like I, at this point in my healing journey, I mean, I'm gluten-free. I eat very few refined oil. I mean, it's it, if you eat out at a restaurant, you're it, it, right. with very few exceptions, you're getting some exposure. So, you know, I'm not 100% on that, but very, you know, we don't have them in the house. Um, and, um, you know, I eat very clean, but I'm not hyper restrictive with things. Like I, I eat a great diet. I feel, you know, um, so this therapeutic diet is a short-term process. It's not a forever thing. I think that's really important to emphasize. And it does get weird for a little while. Um, and it, you know, you can have food sensitivities and by things like lettuce or avocado or like these foods that seem so innocuous. I mean, I remember, um, in that client with pots, I remember she was drinking turmeric lattes every single day, you know, coconut milk. It sounded so like, oh my gosh, how could this be wrong? And she was sensitive to turmeric. So this anti-inflammatory beverage in her body was actually stimulating an inflammatory process. So it's you, you can't figure that out without testing. So we remove the stuff temporarily while we do the healing work. And then um, it just it relieves that huge pressure on the immune system. And oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes this process alone is enough to really turn the tides with that immune system. And I've seen so many autoimmune presentations go into full remission. I mean, including really complex ones, you know, myasthenia gravis, like these ones where people are like, what? Like there's nothing we can do, but there is. If you remove those stressors from the immune system, especially the heavy hitting ones, then um, it's amazing how, how what you can see, the what the body is a healing machine. That's what we're yeah. designed to do. It will come back into balance given the right environment. Yeah. And I know with my clients, I see that a lot when they go and get the food sensitivity, since sensitivity testing, wherever they're going, whatever tests they're doing, they're saying, oh, I'm sensitive to this, this, and this. And then they cut it out of their life and they think they can never, ever eat it again. Like, oh, nope, I can't eat tomatoes. And then it's like for the next 50 years, I'm never going to have a tomato again. Right. And they're not focused on the actual healing process and healing the gut. They're just thinking, oh, I'm sensitive to this food and, and I am never going to be able to have that food again. And like you said, I think gluten's a deal breaker with everybody and every protocol that I write someone, I'm like, it is in your best interest to be gluten-free because it damages the intestinal tract so much. And there's so much so research much. on that. Like people butt it all the time, but I'm like, nope, <laughs> like, that's just, mm -hmm. if you want to be at your healthiest, I think that that's, that's necessary, but it's not forever. Just like when I write people protocols for, um, you know, their time to eating when they're very, very metabolically ill and some carbohydrate restriction, because they're not metabolizing carbohydrates. It's like, this is not forever, but we need 
to let you get out of your own way and let not let the body heal. And once you are in a healthier place, whether it's a metabolic syndrome or if it's an autoimmune disease, your body has the capabilities to heal itself. You just have to let, let it like get, get the things out of the way that are coming, you know, like, like a barrier. Um, so you do the MRT testing for food sensitivity. Do you do the GI map for a stool? I do the GI map. Oh. Exactly. That's exactly what combination that we use. It is the magic combination one without the other. Those yeah. Amazing, but the combination yeah. together is profound. Yeah. My son's had a GI map and the amount of, um, of information that you get back is yeah. crazy. It is. <laughs> so, um, but yes, having that with the, the, um, the sensitivity testing, at least gives you some direction, like you said, yeah. and then instead of just trying to figure out, and you know, if I have clients who are like, Oh, I can only eat five foods, like, oh, really? I know. you know, like that, that's so sad. Like you don't want to live like yeah. that forever. So that, that's helpful to look at each individual person and the food sensitivities. Um, do you ever use, if somebody can't afford um, the testing, I always kind of, I want to get your thoughts on this. Like let's do a carnivore diet for like a month mm -hmm. and eliminate everything that is typically problematic. And then you can start adding things back in one at a time, but you need to wait at least three days because yeah. some people are like, Oh, I've, I felt fine after I ate this, you know, today, but maybe they'd get a headache two days later and not ever link it to that food. So, um, and folks who maybe can't afford the, the testing, would you recommend that as a route to go? It can absolutely. I mean, I feel like that's as close to a true, I mean, the, the challenge with elimination diets is exactly what you just identified is that there's that delayed reaction. Part of the reason why I love the MRT so much is they do it because of the, the what they're testing is not the mechanism. They're capturing those foods that trigger the delayed reaction, which is an, an antibody mediated relax, reaction typically. So that's part of the reason why I love them so much. But yeah, that, I mean, if the, the closest you can get to um, like true elimination, I mean, the challenge is if they're having sensitivities to some of those proteins, which does happen for sure. But if they can tolerate, all, you know, the animal proteins and go carnivore, then yeah, I've definitely seen people really feel so much better on the carnivore diet. It is a, it's a bit of a hard diet to sustain. Yeah. Um, and it's a hard diet to convince someone to, to do, yes. <laughs> um, because there's so much fear around consuming that much animal protein. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think if, if one was to just to want like sort of the most sort of the most rigorous, um, yeah. And, and I would also not say to do it for more than like a month or two. I think it's really important, you know, I mean, it's, it can be a really nice reset. Um, but we do need, um, we do need plant fibers. We need to support our microbiome. You know, there's other, there's sort of downsides to that over the long term. I think any really restrictive diet in yes. any direction long-term becomes problematic. They can all be really invaluable short-term therapeutically. Um, but it becomes problematic when it's like this, you know, and I know, I, I, I know this very well because I, I was vegetarian for a long time and then kept thinking I just wasn't vegetarian enough, you know? And so yes. I would go more yeah. and more vegan. And I was just like, it was so wrong for my body on every level. I mean, I've never been sicker than when I was vegan, but I just, I didn't think about the fact that like, maybe this diet isn't working for me. It felt like I just wasn't doing it right. Yes. You know, and we kind of, you know, the personality of this can get really, I, I think that another piece of this, you know, we talk about the hypervigilance of the immune system, but um, often that can match the hypervigilance of our personality and some of our behaviors, right? I think that there's often, um, you know, our, our physical symptoms, how they manifest often mirror or can, can tell us a lot about some of our personalities and some of the, some of the things that are going on for us emotionally. And I think that the best um, healing protocols will sort of take some of that into consideration and recognize that we can do all the gut healing in the world. We can remove those inflammatory foods. We can find other immune stressors, et cetera. But if you are like beating yourself up every day, day in, day out, kind of a metaphor for what's going on in your immune system. So we need to be looking at ourselves as whole people, because of course we are much more than just a collection of cells. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, when my son was still so ill, I thought the same thing about that. I'm like, he, he was always a nail biter. He was always, you know, just anxious and always had to be moving all, you know, never just sit. He's, he's got, a, it's weird. Cause he's got a chill personality. He's mm -hmm. my easiest kid to mother, but he internalizes a lot of things. 
and doesn't tell, you know, like he's one of those who's constantly worrying, but it's just in his own head. And so we, we've had to do some work with, with that as well. But yeah. And it's like, you think it's just one thing, but it is, it's the, the whole complexity of the human body is, yeah. is um, yeah, it, it's amazing um, that, that it can see the healing that it does. Um, one more question, and then we'll talk more about like your books and where people can learn more about you. But, um, a lot of people listening to this podcast have metabolic issues, um, dealing with metabolic issues, a lot of type two diabetics, pre-diabetics, mm -hmm. um, blood sugar dysregulation, a lot of people struggling with weight issues, and we talk a lot about like time eating and, and making sure we're not having really big, um, you know, changes in our blood sugar throughout the day, but how do food sensitivities and, um, certain foods that, that people are eating that they might think are benign, how does that play into weight loss resistance? And we taught you, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but, um, you know, if people are eating things that are toxic to them and they just, they're, they feel like they're doing all the right things, um, uh, but they're still meeting weight loss resistance, how are food sensitivities or, or some fault in the digestion process coming into play with that? You know, one of the key connections there, I mean, there's multiple in terms of like the microbiome balance, but another, when we're talking food sensitivities in particular, I mean, you know, the major connection there is inflammation. So when you're highly inflamed, your body is not letting go of weight, water weight, fat weight. I mean, it's just, um, and certain, you know, genetically certain people are very predisposed, you know, the fat cells themselves actually become very inflamed and kind of become, and so you, you have to be thinking about inflammation when you're thinking about, um, when you're thinking about the, the weight component, because, um, the body, it, you know, the our bodies are really smart. Um, they protect us. And if there's a weight loss resistant situation, that weight's protecting you from something. Um, and so you, again, this is where we ask the questions why, but if you can start to, if you can really identify and remove sources of inflammation, definitely from the diet, um, as well as, you know, in, in the microbiome, you can have different, I mean, there's all sorts of, um, you know, there's certain bacteria that produce LPS, those lipopolysaccharides, which are just so damaging. And just like, I mean, I'll describe things as agents of inflammation, but these are like the heavy hitters, right? They can just cause so much, so many problems and any kind of imbalance in that microbiome. I mean, there's certain, there's certain bacteria that will like really create an environment that's just much more conducive to weight gain and weight loss resistance. I mean, they've done these incredible studies with mice and with rats, with fecal transplants, change nothing in their diets. But when they add, um, you know, fecal matter from another animal, whether that's, an, you know, if you'd give it, take it from a lean and muscular <laughs> mouse and put it into the obese mice, mouse and watch them change or vice versa, you know, you can really see the impact of our microbiome. And we honestly don't even understand it. I mean, I'll be, I, I think we're just at such the beginning. Yeah pieces of like understanding this incredibly complicated relationship that we have the bacteria with each other and with us and like the interplay. I mean, it's just sort of like this new frontier. We're just every single day learning more things about it. And it's still, we, there's far more that we don't understand than what we do understand, but we do know that there is an interplay, very profound interplay between the health of our microbiome um, and our body's ability to be lean or be, maintain and hold on to weight. Also just, you know, a lot of times toxins are stored in fat. And um, if there's a toxic burden in the system, their body will not let go of that weight because if it did, it mobilizes all those toxins. And now that's actually putting you in danger. So it's a protective mechanism. So uh, the body always has a wisdom. There's nothing quote unquote wrong in terms of your body is not betraying you. It's giving you invaluable information. And our work is to listen to what it's telling us and to respond appropriately, not just try to sort of muscle it into like the shape that we want or the health that we want, right? Like we have to listen to it, work with it. Um, and when 
you know, we talk a lot. So I, I run a training program where we train health practitioners in some of these more advanced tools, you know, how to work with the GI map and the MRT, how to look at labs, not from a position of trying to diagnose anything, but trying to identify underlying imbalances. And we talk a lot about, you know, you need to have a body in balance with the right tools and you need to make sure that you've identified anything that's blocking the healing process and removed that. And that's really the work when it comes to sort of a functional nutritional approach. Approach. It's making sure the body is well equipped to do what it needs to do. And at the same time, identifying and removing anything that's getting in the way of that. When you do those things, it's like the body just takes care of itself and it knows what to do. Weight comes right back into exactly what it should be. And it's not about, you don't have to be micromanaging a lot of these details um, when, when you, when we remove those things. But if, if you're certainly, if you're eating foods that are toxic, if you're eating foods that are highly inflammatory, um, doesn't matter the macro ratios, you know, all of these other things, like you really, it, you need to, um, that those things are blocking the body's ability to heal. And the fact that it's keeping that weight on is it's some, in, in some way it's protecting you. So the question is, what is it protecting you from? And how can you remove that thing that it's protecting you from? So it doesn't need to maintain the weight. Yeah. And I always tell my clients, like if your body has the correct environment and the correct building blocks, it wow. will heal itself. But until that time, you're probably beating around the bush with, with, um, you know, trying to make strives that just aren't happening. And I know my book, like that's my, the first step in my book is let's get all, you know, get your body less toxic, like give it good fuel get rid of the things that, that are, that could be standing in the way, whether it's food or personal care products. And like you said, at the beginning, it's just, it can get so overwhelming, but just, you know, doing one thing at a time, peeling back one layer at a time and getting your body just a little bit healthier from day to day can have dramatic effects over time. So, um, yeah, I was going to ask you about the practitioner training program. So we, yeah. you, we mentioned that if there's somebody who listening is interested in learning to teach what you teach, that's amazing. Um, I wish I would have known about that years ago. <laughs> I would, would have definitely gone through that. Um, but I know you've written some books. So tell us about your mm -hmm. books and you've got a lot going on. You got the practitioner training program. You see clients, you write books. Like where can we find more about you and your services? So, yeah, so a couple of books, I mean, those, those were actually a long time ago now. So Eat Naked <laughs> and The Naked Foods Cookbook um, are the two books. Um, so the first one just really wanted to kind of distill down some of these principles, just trying to unpack, like, what do we eat, right? So I went through each of the different food categories, like dairy, like, let's just talk about dairy and why is it so problematic? And if you were to eat it, like, what do you need to be mindful of with it? And like, what's the best form of dairy? What's the one you like never want to have on your plate, that kind of thing. So I did that for each food group. That's what eat naked. And when I say eat naked, it was all about like, let's just like take away all the unnecessary things, all the unnecessary, like all the process processing, all the pesticides, all of the packaging, like, let's just get back to real whole foods. Um, it's not a vegan book. Some people, I think there's something about <laughs> that name that people think it means raw vegan. I don't know why, but that's not what it is. Um, and then um, the Naked Foods Cookbook, um, my um, my husband is a chef and we collaborated on that together. In fact, he helped me. We met when I was writing Eat Naked and he helped me with the recipes in the first book. And that's kind of how we fell in love. And then we wrote a follow-up cookbook together. So that's the Naked Foods Cookbook. Both, all of them are dedicated gluten-free um, with um, variations for all different types of of food. Yes. Restaurant. And your husband, James Berry has been on this podcast. I should have looked up yes. what episode it was, but, um, <laughs> talk to us about meat-based diets and, and, um, organ seasoning. So look yeah. back on that. If, if you are interested. Absolutely. Um, and then in terms of, so eat naked kitchen is, um, eat naked kitchen.com. That is my private practice. That's also a wealth of information. The, it's like over 450 different articles and recipes. A lot of James recipes are up there. Um, and, um, you know, we, I have a, I have a clinical team, so it's myself and I have three other clinicians, um, and a health coach. And so we support clients all over, you know, all over the world really, um, with, autoimmune in particular, but all sorts of different kind of chronic health issues and using these tools to help reverse those things and get their lives back. 
And then as you're saying, you know, the restorative wellness solutions is the practitioner training. So it's for, it's, it's not a starting point is you need to already be either a licensed or properly certified health professional of some sort. I would say about 70 to 80% of the students who come through are nutritionists of some sort. Um, but also we have DOs and acupuncturists and chiropractors and some medical doctors, a couple dentists. So we've had, you know, also all, all ranges. Um, and it's basically teaching some more of these, as I said, the advanced tools of functional nutrition, like how to work really comprehensively and strategically with, um, with labs to just create much better and more informed and targeted protocols. Because I, you know, I remember when I started practicing and I'd be, I'd be curious you know, if this has been your experience as well, but there was so much I could do like 15 years ago with diet alone. Mm -hmm. And now I find that people's health is just so much more complicated. We can definitely move the needle with diet, but we can't get them the whole distance. We have to do that deeper digging. And it's kind of like looking under the hood, you know, when you use labs, you're just be able to sort of see what's going on in, inside the body in a different way. So um, we teach people how to do that. And also it's a great resource for finding a practitioner who is very skilled at using all of these tools I've talked about today. So if you go to restorativewellnesssolutions.com, there's a link, find a practitioner. We have practitioners um, all over the US and in 13 countries internationally. So um, you should be able to find someone who is doing great work in this field. Amazing. And I bet more people than not would benefit from going and finding a practitioner. If, um, like you said, if you've done the nutrition work, you've done, you feel like, you know, your sleep's dialed in, your stress is dialed in, you're, you feel like you're doing all the things this, then it's time to get some advanced testing done and work with, um, a qualified health professional. So absolutely. We appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing all that information with us. And in closing, it's just like, there is hope. I know some of the clients that I work with are just like, my body's broken. And I always tell them, no, like it's not, that there's just more work to be done. Like your body's not broken. Human bodies aren't meant to be sick. They're meant to thrive and, and, and be well. It's just, you have to remove the barriers and let them heal. So we love all the work that you're doing and the help that you're giving so many people and um, all of your practitioners as well. And I hope tons and tons of people go through your practitioner training program to learn. Yeah. 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 So thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me.